Nice one. <laughs> Believe it or not, the hardest part of this is getting from there to here. <laughs> I want to thank, uh, of course, God for giving me another opportunity to teach his word to you, allowing me to continue this series. Uh, did you guys hear uh, Andy's Stealing the Mind session? It was great. Uh, you guys should tune in. Um, is he preaching this morning? He is, huh? Anyway, um, the title of this sermon is Replacement Theology, What We Should Know, Part 3. And uh, before we start, can we pray? <coughs> Father God, we acknowledge you as God Almighty, and we just want to praise you. Uh, we want to praise you because you are the maker of heaven and earth. And uh, we commit this time to you, Father. Use me as you see fit. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, in prior sessions together, We went to great lengths to lay a foundation in regard to replacement theology. We attempted to trace the line of, of replacement theology throughout church history. We asked and answered many questions like what is replacement theology? And we established that it is. Uh, also, it's known as supersessionism and fulfillment theology. And it's the idea that Israel because of her rejection of her Messiah, has been essentially disowned by God and therefore forfeiting all of her promises, her covenantal promises, only to, only to be super, superseded by the church. And according to the replacement theology, the church now becomes true Israel and the church fulfills the role of Israel, thus acquiring all her promises. And we also asked, when did replacement theology show up? We went all the way back in church history and found that uh, the concepts therein never really showed up until the mid-second century. We discovered that the formulation and the rise of this doctrine was really a mixture of things, uh, a series of historical events that happened with both the church and Israel. Things, things like uh, a, a severed relationship uh, between the Jewish community and the church, a, a new and growing Gentile church, I may add. Uh, and because of this relationship, the strained relationship, the Gentile church began to perceive and interpret Scripture with an anti-Semitic bias or lens. Mix, mix that up with uh, Greek philosophy and you get the allegorizing of Scripture <clears throat> and the rise of allegorizing of Scripture is what essentially solidified these ideas within the church. We also learned the, the rise of certain historical figures like Constantine, which opened the floodgates of, of, uh, of a dominant Gentile and anti-Semitic church. Uh, it's been said when Constantine uh, came into power, the kingdom was here. The earth was Christianized, and we are living in the kingdom now. And this also propelled the idea of replacement theology. Um, we briefly talked about the idea of uh, amillennialism, uh, where there is no kingdom, or there is no coming kingdom, I should say, Rather, it's here now and in our midst. And uh, I'm glad that Pastor Andy is uh, starting his series on the coming kingdom, which dispels this idea. He will eventually dispel this idea of amillennialism and set the record straight. We also looked at the effects of replacement theology on the Jewish people, which was continual persecution and oppression, and all throughout uh, history, 
post-Israel, the Jews, in some way or some form or some degree, uh, by many of the world powers, uh, tyrants and figures, have been persecuted and oppressed and harassed, even, even to this day. And there is no nation I know of in the history of nations that, uh, that has ever been bullied around like Israel has. We learned how dangerous replacement theology can be and how it affected the church and what it brought into the church through its doctrines, through its practices, through art, uh, and things of that nature. It affected how the church viewed Israel and treated Israel. And the, the evangelical church since then, since the uh, second century, has an ugly and embarrassing past in regard to the relationship with the Jews. Uh, replacement theology can also shift and derail the role of the church, the function of the church. Beyond that, we dis also discovered that uh, theology affects the church's eschatology, the view of the end times. And uh, this doctrine is deeply entrenched in the church today and has far-reaching implications affecting not only the church, but uh, government policy, as we have seen uh, with the prior administ administration. But thank God for new administrations, right? Uh, thank God that uh, he is in control. So the first two sessions, we kind of zoomed out and seen things from a bird's eye view of replacement theology. And today in part three, we'll continue in this, uh, in this uh, vein and kind of zoom in, get a little bit closer and try to answer the question, does the Bible support replacement theology? And to lay the groundwork for this session, we really have to understand what we're dealing with, who and what we're dealing with here. To answer the who question, we're dealing with family here. Truly, we're dealing with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, we're dealing with brothers and sisters who hold to a, a train of thought on the other, on the, the very opposite end of the theological spectrum. And in fact, there could be people in this room or listening via the website and online that, uh, that have those views. In fact, I know there is. So this is an in-house discussion, an in-house debate, family debate. But at the end of the day, we're all saved, amen? And so I think it's only fitting that before we dig into this, no matter what theological persuasion you may have, we check our pride and leave it at the door as we approach this topic. And do so in love. Amen. So to answer the what question, we're wrestling with an idea that I believe, as we have learned, has plagued the church since its inception. The idea that the church has replaced or fulfilled or superseded national Israel. And surely, if replacement theologians say that this is the case, then we should find ample evidence of this idea represented in Scripture. Right? So my goal for today is not to attack, but to both reference various scholars from both camps, and more importantly, go to Scripture and really see what the Bible says about this idea of the church in Israel. Because this is what we're dealing with here. The church, the idea that the church has replaced Israel. Does the Bible support this the idea of a, of a, of a covenant-keeping God replacing the apple of his eye? Israel. So there are two competing views in this equation. There are those that hold to a dispensational theology, and then there are those that hold to a perspective called covenant theology. 
you can also call it uh, Reformed theology. Covenant theologians, by and large, hold to the doctrine of replacement theology or fulfillment theology. So very briefly, here's a helpful chart that delineates the distinctives of both covenant theology and dispensational theology. You are in a dispensational church, by the way. And you will notice all the major portions to the left, or, or positions, I should say, to the left, and beliefs to the right of both the covenant theology and dispensational theology. The hermeneutic, it's just a fancy way of saying the art and science of Bible interpretation of the covenant theologian is a partial allegorical one. Whereas the hermeneutic of the dispensational theologian is a normal, literal interpretation. That's not to say the, the covenant theologian uh, doesn't use literal interpretation. But by and large, they use allegorical uh, uh, interpretation for things like prophecy and eschatology. Concerning the purpose of God, unlike covenant theologian, we, we view God's underlying purpose in the world as, or, or let, me, let me rephrase that, covenant theologians view the purpose of God as soteriological or salvific. And the dispensational, dispensationalists believe that the purpose of God is doxological. Meaning that God is at work in the world today for his glory and his glory alone. The God's glory is the end game, if I could say it that way. His purposes can't be so soteriological. Not to take anything away from salvation or soteri uh, soteriology, but who gets the glory when the unbeliever is saved? God does. Salvation is a glorious thing, but salvation is not the end game. His glory is. Moving down the chart, how do the two camps view Israel and the church? In complete opposites. There's no distinction, says the covenant theologian. In fact, the church takes her place and appropriates her role, Israel's role. And notice, if you will, the top three tiers, hermeneutic, purpose of God, and Israel and the church. This is, this is uh, what is known by dispensationalists as the synchrona of dispensationalism. Uh, in other words, these three positions uh, are the trademark of a genuine dispensationalist. They go hand in hand. This is what Ryrie said concerning the synchrona. The essence of dispensationalism is the distinction between Israel and the church. This grows out of the consistent employment of normal or plain or historical grammatical interpretation. And it reflects an understanding of the basic purpose of God, and that is glorifying himself. That's the end game. Feel free, feel free to review the chart on your own, but I just wanted to show a stark contrast of the two camps and get an idea of what we're up against. An opposite of systems. <clears throat> More of the uh, modern and prominent uh, covenant theologians today would include such people as Louis Burkhoff, Charles Hodge, Kenneth Gentry, John Stott, R.C. Sproul Sr. and Jr., and, and many more. Covenant theologians. Now let's zoom in a little closer. Why do replacement theologians believe that the church has replaced Israel or has no distinctions? Why do they believe that? And where do they get this idea that the church has superseded or fulfilled the role of Israel? And again, surely the, if, if that's the case, the Bible will have a handful of, of evidence, of texts, of passages that would explain that. Or, or even God's decree that, uh, 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 that God has inaugurated this transformation of, the Israel, of Israel to the church, right? But 
That's not the case. I don't believe the Bible makes uh, such declarations. And I know I, was, I mentioned to a few of you that uh, we were going to engage Galatians 6.16, Romans 9.26, and we will. But I think patience at this point in our study will benefit us. I believe I would be doing you a disservice if uh, we did not settle the issue of biblical distinctions between Israel and the church. On the top there, William Cox, an amillennialist, said the terms Israel and the church in the Bible can be used interchangeably. On the bottom, a man named Kenneth Gentry said this, We believe in the unfolding plan of God in history. The Christian church is the very fruition of the redemptive purposes of God. As such, the multiracial international church of Jesus Christ supersedes racial, national Israel as the focus of the kingdom of God. Indeed, we believe the church becomes the Israel of God. And then he references Galatians 6.16. This is John Stott, another covenant theologian. He said in his book, The Message of Galatians, he said, those who are in Christ today, he's referring to the church, are the Israel of God. Now allow me to challenge these ideas and show from Scripture that the Bible does, does the Bible does distinguish Israel from the church. And the following, I believe, are five of the strongest scriptural evidences that prove the distinctions between Israel and the church. So here we go. <clears throat> the first biblical evidence for the distinction of the Israel and the church is that the church was born at Pentecost. The church was born at Pentecost. In contrast, Israel came from a man called Abram. The very first reference of the term church, or ecclesia in the Greek, ever found in the Bible is Matthew 16, 18. However, you'll notice that when Christ uses this term, Christ uses the term church, he uses it in a future tense. I will build my church. Many of you are familiar with that verse. Here the church is prophesied. The Bible actually records the birth of the church in Acts 2. And it's a beautiful account of this. Uh, it's a beautiful account of the 12 apostles, Matthias being the, the new guy, on the day of Pentecost. They obeyed Jesus and stayed in Jerusalem and waited for the Holy Spirit who was to come on them, to come upon them. Um, and as the story goes, the Holy Spirit fell upon them like a rushing wind. And, and they began to speak in other languages. And on that day, Scripture says, 3,000 souls were saved, Acts 2 and 4. It also says the Lord was adding to their number Day by day. That was in Acts 2, um, 7, I believe it was. So Christ was already at work fulfilling his promises of building his church. Didn't he say, I will build my church? He said that in Matthew 16, 18. In contrast, when did the nation of Israel begin? Again, it, be, he be, it began with a... With one, with one man, Abram. Abram. I was going to say Abraham. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God declares to Abraham a handful of beautiful promises, one of them being a great nation. Genesis 12, 2 says, And I will make you a great nation. This is even before the covenant 
of Abraham. Lewis Sperry Chafer in his eight-volume set, Systematic Theology set, said, said this about the Jewish people. By the call of Abraham and all that Jehovah wrought in him, a new race of stock was begun, which under unalterable divine covenants and promises continues forever. He goes on to say, so different is this race as to distinctive characteristics that all other people are antipodal, meaning diametrically opposite to this nation. They are classified as the Gentiles or the nations, as in dissimilarity to the Jewish people. So Israel has existed in the days of Genesis, coming forth from a man named Abram. And in contrast, the church came forth on the day of Pentecost, well over 2,000 years removed from Israel. The church is also called, called the body of Christ. We'll talk more about that later. But once the church was born, entrance into this body was subject to extreme vetting. Imagine that meaning not all could come, but only through a spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 says that. Jesus called it being born again or being born of the spirit. John 3, 3. And one condition triggers it. One condition alone, and that's faith alone in Christ alone. And on that note, when did the spirit baptism into Christ's body actually begin? In Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus said, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. This was Jesus speaking. Then during the birth of the church, in Acts 2, look at what Luke said. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The birth of the church was at Pentecost. Well, some say, Gabe, Luke doesn't say or use the term spirit baptism there in Acts 2, in chapter, one through, chapter 2, 1 through 4. He used the term filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, Luke actually confirms this spirit baptism all the way in Acts 11. 15 through 16, this was our opening verse. Luke records Peter saying this, and, I was, and as I began to speak, the Holy, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. What beginning? The beginning of the church in Acts 2. Verse 16 says, And I, and I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, now he's referencing Christ's statement in Acts 1, 5. John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Spirit baptism. In contrast, membership to the Jewish nation was by birth. Membership required being descended from the loins of Abraham. Or you could become an Israelite by conversion to the nation, also known as a proselyte. Yet, the replacement theologian or supersessionists or the fulfillment theologian claims that the church and Israel have no distinctions and that the church was always and the church has always existed. I cannot agree with that statement, given the biblical evidence. Because of the glaring difference of over 2,000 years between the two entities, the Bible doesn't, it doesn't support that view. The Bible teaches that the church was born at Pentecost, while the nation was wrought from a man named Abram in Genesis 12. The second evidence for the distinction of Israel and the church is this. Certain events of Christ 
were essential to the establishment of the church, namely the resurrection and the ascension. Regarding the resurrection, Ephesians 1, chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 through 23 says this, which he, who is he? That's God the Father, brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In other words, the church would not exist or be functional if it were not for the resurrection of Christ. It was necessary for this future entity. And what about the ascension? In John 14, 12, Jesus says something very interesting to his disciples. And I believe what Jesus was doing in this statement in John 14, 12, he was looking forward to his own church. How do I know that? Well, the reference is in John 14. And this is a pop quiz for all you Bible students. What is happening in John 14? Particularly between chapters 13 and 17. The upper room discourse. And from, we, and from what we learned uh, in the book of John, that the upper room discourse, he reveals, Jesus reveals, seed form truths about his building project called the church. So regarding Christ's ascension, in John 14, 12, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, notice those, those words, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. He's, he's speaking of the ascension here. Because I go to the Father. Notice the, the term, because. It's the... There it is. It's the Greek word hoti. Uh, the B dag calls it the marker of causality. If I could say it another way, Jesus is saying to the apostles or the foundations of his church, you will not have the ability to perform greater works than me if I do not go back to my Father. So this power of doing greater works also known as the Holy Spirit in us, could only be, it could only be manifest after the ascension of Christ. These two events, the resurrection and the ascension, were essential for the establishment of the church. In contrast, what certain events were essential to the establishment of the nation of Israel? Well, the Bible says it hinged on the faith and the obedience of one man. Genesis 12.1 says, says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the, to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. So prior to God's call on Abraham, Genesis, Genesis reveals that there were there was one division of people on the earth. Just one. Genesis 11 says, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. God himself called them one people with the same language. In Genesis 11, 6, if you read further, you'll learn the account of the Tower of Babel. Andy is going through a study of the coming kingdom on Wednesday nights. Let me just put his face up there for a plug. And it's called the coming kingdom. 
Uh, and I encourage you to go. It's a, it's a great study. But in Andy's book, he, he refers to a, a historian, uh, Alexander Hislop. And in Hislop's research, he discovered that there was one world political, economical, and religious system going on there in Genesis 11, headed up by a man named Nimrod. And that religious system was called the mother-child cult. This slide is probably familiar to some of you. And since God knows what absolute power given to a single person can do or can result in absolute corruption, what did God do? He, he halted this building project, dead in its track, by confusing their language. And once God did that, Hislop said each people group, when the people scattered, they couldn't understand each other, each people group took a, took a, a portion or baggage of this religi religious system wherever they went. It's an amazing study. And as you can see, so the image, the image to your right is an actual illustration from Hislop's book depicting two examples of this mother-child uh, cult system. Uh, the one on the left is Babylon, and the one on the right is India. And so as each people group, with their new language, separated in each direction, uh, they brought along this baggage, this, re this religious system. And so God, then God, calls this man, this one man, out of the, uh, the Chaldeans. What does it say? Genesis 12.1. From the Ur of the Chaldeans, it said. There's Ur in that big red, big red circle there. And he called him out. While Abram believes God and walks with God on this journey, he realizes that God has a very special calling on his life. Namely, to be the forebearer of this nation called Israel. Now, why am I saying this? Because we're talking about two entirely different entities here in regard to the church in Israel. This is a huge distinction that separates the two. The, the, the establishment of the church and the establishment of Israel. This brings us to the third evidence. <clears throat> the third evidence that distinguishes the church distinguishes the church from Israel. And that's the mystery character of the church. What is a mystery? The Greek calls this mystery mysterion. It's a divine truth that was hidden and not revealed in the Old Testament. That's what a mystery is. Later to be revealed in the New. What's an example of a mystery? Can we turn to Colossians 2, chapter 2? Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Colossians 2 tells us that the mystery of God is Christ Jesus. In Colossians chapter 2, 1 through 3, Paul is speaking. He says, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. And for those who, at, who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in the love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. Here it is. Resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So how is Christ God's mystery? Was he not God revealed to man? Did Jesus not say, those who have seen me have seen the Father? Did Jesus not equate himself to God by using the title, I am? Got the uh, religious leaders furious. What are these? These are mysteries. Now revealed. And why is the church so distinct from Israel? Because of the mystery 
of the character of the church. There are at least four defining mysteries of the church. And uh, let me go through them. The first one is the indwelling of Christ, the mystery of the indwelling of Christ in every believer. This is the Christ concept in you, or the, I should say the Christ in you concept. Colossians 1, chapter 1, verse 24 through 27 reads, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do, not, I do, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry on or carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generation, but has now been manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This Christ in you concept is a very technical term Paul uses. He uses it throughout the book of Colossians. He uses in him, buried with him, alive with him. Your life is hidden with him. In him, in Christ. Very technical. Christ says, uh, he says Christ all in all. Christ is all in all. Now, how is that a contrast? The church, according to this verse, has an exclusive benefit of God, of having Christ now permanently residing or indwelling in the hearts of believers. This is huge, folks. In contrast, Israel as a whole, as an entity, was never given this benefit. In fact, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, not Christ, in the Old Testament was selective and temporary. The Spirit selectively came upon such Old Testament people like David, Joshua, Saul. And in, re in regard to duration, for example, God's favor left an individual like Saul the Spirit left him. Temporary. The Spirit would depart. And in regard to the New Testament church, all believers are indwelled at this point, or at, at, at the point of faith. Permanently indwelled. With both the Holy Spirit and Christ. Amen? So much so, the book of Ephesians uses the word like sealed, guaranteed, indicating the permanency of this indwelling, the Christ in you concept. The second defining mystery of the church is that the New Testament church is called the Bride of Christ. This is Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and 33. Paul holds a brief marriage clinic to the, to the Ephesians. And he reveals a beautiful truth. He equates the relationship with, of Christ and his church with that of a married man and a woman. He says in verse 22, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. This is a mystery. And if you read the rest of the section, you will see the beautiful comparison. If you skip down to verse 23, I believe, he says this, For this reason, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. And then he says, but I'm speaking with reference to the Christ, to Christ and the church. You 
you know what? The Bible reveals striking resemblances of the Jewish wedding to that of the church and her relationship with Christ. We call it the, the Jewish wedding analogy. And as you see in, in this chart, I don't know if you can see it, the words are very small. There's striking similarities. The marriage covenant in the Jewish wedding was initiated by the groom, starting from the top. Likewise, and, and initiated upon payment. Likewise, Christ initiates a new covenant, which was Christ's sac sacrificial death. Yeah? Didn't, didn't his uh, uh, resurrection or, and blood ratify this new covenant? Moving down, look at number two. Bride set apart exclusively to the groom in the Jewish marriage. And the church is positionally sanctified. Sanctified means set apart. And it gives you the, the, the scripture references. How about number five? The groom returns at an unknown time to retrieve her bride, that's, that's in an actual Jewish, ancient Jewish marriage. My, that sounds like the rapture. The rapture is at an unknown time. This is an amazing truth when you compare the two. The Bible calls the church the bride of Christ. A mystery. This is Dr. Cornelius Venema, president and professor of Mid-America Reformed Seminary, also a writer of Ligonier Ministries. You guys are familiar with that, that uh, ministry. It's a ministry founded by R.C. Sproul, <clears throat> also a Reformed and Covenant theologian. This is what Venema said in his article, Israel and the Church, the Issue. He says, in the Reformed view, the gospel of Jesus Christ directly fulfills the promise of the covenant of grace for all believers, whether Jews or Gentiles. Do you see the, the ice of Jesus in action right there? Covenant of grace. This is the alleged covenant which God supposedly made with mankind. Quote, administered to man from the time of the law to the time of the gospel. This is verbatim from the, from the Westminster uh, confession of faith, the covenant of, of grace. He goes on, Israel and the church are not two distinct peoples. Rather, the church is the true Israel of God, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. He referenced as 1 Peter 2.9. Is this true? How does the Bible describe Israel and her relationship with God. God says in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14 of Israel, these words, I am married to you, he said. In another translation, it says, I am your husband. So when did God and Israel get married? Uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum Jewish scholar, in an excellent article entitled The Wife of Jehovah and the Bride of Christ, explains that during the visit on Mount Sinai, God made a covenant with Israel. And Fruchtenbaum observed after this covenant, the Jewish prophets always viewed this covenant relationship as a marriage covenant. The church can't be Israel. She's not married yet. The church is said to be married to, th to her groom in Revelation 19.9. It's future. And Israel, sadly, is deemed in the Old Testament to be uh, an adulteress, a harlot. Uh, and God gave her a writ or a certificate of divorce in Jeremiah 3, 8. Don't you, be, don't you need to be married to be divorced? 
And don't you have to be married to commit adultery? However, the faithfulness of God and the restored blessings of God were prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah in the form of a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. In contrast, when you study the church, you see a radical difference. The bride of Christ is to, pres is to be presented a pure virgin. 2 Corinthians 11 to 2, or I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 2 says, For I am jealous for you, Paul is speaking, with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. These are two entirely different entities. Arnold Fruchtenbaum said this, In the Bible, Israel is represented as the wife of Jehovah, whereas Christ, or I'm sorry, whereas the church is presented as the bride of Christ, the Messiah. A failure to maintain that distinction will only result in a misinterpretation of what the scriptures teach. This brings us to our third <clears throat> mystery characteristic of the church. And it's the mystery of the rapture of the church. Can we turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 15? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 55. Here Paul uh, reveals and unfolds this beautiful mystery called the rapture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51. Paul says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must, be, must put on imperishable, and this mor mortal must put on immorality. Immortality, excuse me. <laughs> but when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that it is, it, it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Paul reveals the, the, the mystery of the rapture. I believe Jesus speaks of this same mystery of the rapture in John 14, 1 through 4. And if you recall, John 14 takes place in the upper room, the upper room discourse. And in that discourse, we learn that he reveals seed form truths to the disciples. This is what Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Some of you are saying to yourself, Self? I don't see a reference to the rapture here. Well, please notice these phrases of Christ. If you compare these sayings and phrases of Christ in this passage with Paul's infamous rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 8, you will see a stunning an exact parallel. You guys can turn there if you will. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. Paul says, here it is. Hope you can read that. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him with him 
those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive remain until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, notice these words of Paul. And compare them with our Savior's. You will notice a fascinating, a conceptual, and a sequential parallel. In John 14, Jesus says, trouble. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, grieve, or some translation says, sorrow. Jesus says, believe. Paul says, believe. Jesus is God and me. Paul says, Jesus and God. Jesus said, I told you. Paul says, I say to you. Jesus says, I will come again. Paul says, coming of the Lord. Jesus says, I will receive you. Paul says, you will be caught up. Jesus said, I will receive you to myself. Paul says, you will meet the Lord. And Jesus says, be where I am. And Paul says, you will always be or ever be with the Lord. Amazing. This is a glorious mystery or truth. It's revealed. After going through this comparison, I don't know how one can deny the equivalence of these words and concepts of Paul and our Savior. Unless he has an underlying motive to minimalize or marginalize or expunge what God has already said, stated in his word. <clears throat> so how does this truth of the mystery of the rapture of the church contrast with that of Israel? First of all, Israel is not a mystery. Israel was never hidden in the Old Testament. Rather, she was in plain view for all to see in both her glory and her shame. In fact, Israel, the term Israel is referenced 2,510 times in the Old Testament. And not once does it ever hint of a New Testament church. It always speaks of either the patriarch himself, formerly known as Jacob, or the ethnic, national, and physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And beyond that, Israel in the Bible is assigned a specific program in the, in the end time scenario, does she not? In Jeremiah 37, chapter 30, verse 7, um, she is prophesied to expect a time in her life known as Jacob's distress or Jacob's trouble, also known as the tribulation. The tribulation will be a time where God unleashes his wrath on Israel for the purpose of their chastisement. And the book of Daniel, a book that we're currently studying, describes this tribulation, Daniel 12. Daniel 12 is set within the time frame of the tribulation. And he, and he says, the angel, uh, the, the tribulation reserved for who? It's reserved for who? The angel Gabriel says to Daniel, it's for your people, Daniel. It's for your people. Daniel 9.24 and Daniel 10.24. And to refrain from stealing uh, Andy's thunder, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, <clears throat> and so in contrast, what is the end time scenario of the church? 
It's not the tribulation. Because we are the bride of Christ, the spotless bride of Christ, we are exempt from this tribulation. Amen? Uh, if we read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Man, that's a glorious truth. That's our hope, beloved. The rapture of the church. So far, we discussed three strong evidence of the, dis of the distinction of both the church and Israel. The indwelling of Christ, of Christ in you. The second was the uh, bride of Christ. The third was the rapture. And the fourth, defining a mystery characteristic of the church, is the body of Christ. The mystery of the body of Christ. Can we turn to Ephesians 3, chapter 3, 1 through 13? This is known as the mystery of the body of Christ. Paul actually reveals and explains in great detail this mystery to the church. He's speaking to believers. Notice verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, for the sake of you, Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the stewardship of grace, which was given to you, uh, to me for you. Verse 3, that by revelation was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read... Hold on one second. When you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not known to the sons of men. There he goes. There he says it. Mystery of, of Christ. As it has now been revealed to his holy apostles, prophets, in the Spirit. Verse 6. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. And fellow partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul is saying here, because of the benefits of the gospel, believing Jews and Gentiles are now in one body. Because of, the, because of the gospel, Gentiles could now be saved. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament are revealed that Gentiles could be saved through faith. He's saying because of the gospel, they've become or they join together in a new and revolutionary concept called the body, the body of Christ. And we have to remember when God called out the nation of Israel through Abraham, God created, in the words of Chafer, a race so distinct in their individuality. And if we back up to Ephesians 2, if you could do so, Ephesians 2 11, verse 11, we discover Paul details the reason for this Gentile inclusion. Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. Therefore, remember, he says, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles, in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so called circumcision, Notice the two groups, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at, the, at, at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, notice the in Christ, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
This is a jam-packed section of Scripture. And allow me to carefully unpack this. Notice Paul reminds the Gentiles that they were called uncircumcised. By who? The circumcised. This was, this was uh, what racial profiling looked like in the ancient times. <laughs> However, who was Paul referring to when he says circumcised? The Jews, right? The nation of Israel. And just by uh, using this term, circumcised, what is Paul dialing back to? The Abrahamic covenant. It was the sign, right? Circumcision. Paul even clarifies himself in verse 12. Remember that you were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. He uses terms like separate, excluded, having no hope, and far off. In other words, they had no relationship to God whatsoever, the Gentiles. Paul describes them Gentiles in the flesh, denoting a whole class of people. So if I got this correct, according to Paul, there is the nation of Israel and the rest of the world, the Gentiles. And then Christ comes along, And because of his work on the cross, specifically his blood, he restores this relationship between God and man. So now, Israel in faith and Gentiles in faith can become one. Through a very technical term known as in Christ or the body of Christ. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, who you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So now these two entities, Israel and Gentile, z, become a new entity. Why is distinction such a big, Paul, uh, big uh, uh, deal? Why is it such a big deal to Paul? Paul says, I'm glad you asked. Let's, let's read on. Paul says, remember where you came from. Because what Christ did for you was, some, was something new. Paul reveals a mystery. Notice Ephesians 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace. Who made both groups into one? In the ASV, it says, who made from two groups one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Verse 15, by abolishing his flesh, the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so that it, in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, he says. Let's stop there. Let's see if I got this right. What did Christ make? He made two groups into one, right? Jews and Gentiles, called the body of Christ. So if he made two groups in, from the two groups one, what are we left with? We're still left with Israel. That's one group. We're still left with the Gentiles. That's another group. Now we have a new man in Christ, made by Christ himself, which makes a third group. It seems clear, very clear, Paul is careful about distinctions here and very careful to identify three groups. Why do I say that? Because as I read Paul's other letters, he acknowledges two groups. Namely, Israel and the church. He does so in Galatians 2.7. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, he also acknowledges the two groups in Galatians 
For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. I also say this because if you read the book of Acts, Israel is mentioned 20 times. And the church is mentioned 19 times. They are both used in a normal and literal sense. And the two entities exist simultaneously. And just for added bonus, Paul identifies the Gentiles too. 30 times he does so. And in the book of Acts, there is no such idea as supersessionism. That said, how is it that theologians, pastors, and professors can say that Israel and the church are not two distinct people? Or say that the church becomes Israel? It's beyond me. So far, we discussed four, actually three, strong evidence evidence says of the distinctions of Israel and the church, which were the church was born at Pentecost. Certain events of Christ were, ser- were, were essential to the establishment of the church. Third, the mystery character of the church, and we went through four defining Uh, mystery characteristics of the church that separate both Israel and the church, the indwelling of Christ, the bride of Christ, the rapture and the body of Christ. The fourth and final evidence of the distinction between Israel and the church is Galatians 6.16. We now reach the key texts that replacement theologians use to support their argument that the church has replaced Israel. And if the Lord tarries, we'll continue this point the next time we meet. Uh, Establishing distinctions as clearly exampled in the Bible, is one, of the, uh, is one of the keys, I believe, to understanding Galatians 6.16. Because I believe Paul acknowledges and distinguishes from the rest yet another group. When we meet next time, we'll engage uh, Galatians 6.16 and other passages. Uh, Replacement theologians use. I thank you for bearing with me through this series. <clears throat> this is truly a robust issue, certainly one that uh, has been around for centuries, and uh, certainly one that we should be versed in. And so, some of you perhaps are here for the first time, wondering, "What the world is he? T- what in the world is he talking about?" <laughs> Well, I'm ultimately trying to defend the immutable character of God <laughs> if, if he needed my help, as, as if he needed my help. The story of the Bible is ultimately about how, how a covenant-keeping God will remain faithful to his chosen people, Israel. He's made a promise, a covenantal promise to his nation, Israel. And God is not a man that he should lie. In fact, it's impossible impossible for God to lie. It would not make logical sense uh, to entertain the idea that God can somehow retract his promises. Uh, Doesn't it say his word does not return unto him void? So if that's true, I can trust him with my salvation. See that? And trusting in God that, and if trusting in God that can retract his, uh, his promises, why would I want to do that? 
That's quite, it's, it's quite opposite. It's, I'm trusting in a God who cannot lie, who will fulfill his promises both to the church and to Israel. He made a promise in John 3.16, granting us everlasting life. And if you're here today and have not trusted in Jesus Christ for your uh, salvation or the safekeeping of your soul, don't hesitate. Do it now. You can do this in the quietness of your own heart and mind and uh, be encouraged because God is a promise keeper. Amen. This is what John 3.16 says. This is Jesus speaking. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Those are Christ's words. Do you notice the one condition there? Believe. Just one. Believe on him. And all the mysteries we talked about uh, today concerning the church and, and yeah, concerning the church and whatnot, they all pertain to you if you believe. But those are just add-ons. The real gift is eternal life with Christ Jesus, our Lord. And I would encourage you to believe. Just believe. Um, and if you've done that, congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. And uh, if you need more information on that, I'm available to talk. Shall we pray? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. Thank you that your word distinguishes uh, entities such as Israel and the church. And thank you, Lord, that you are a covenant-keeping God and that you will fulfill every promise made to Israel. Uh, Lord, we are careful. We will be careful to give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Well, thank you for that uh, message and that teaching this morning, Gabe. Uh, please stand and join in singing.